There's an old saying in finance that cash is king, but when it comes to payments, the data suggests that's no longer exactly the case. According to the latest World Pay report, cash now figures in less than 20% of in-person transactions around the world. The payments industry from the beginning has, has really focused on getting people to use electronic forms of, of, of payment. In fact, if you look at like the US, for example, you basically have been moving around two to 3% of payments from cash and check to some form of, of direct electronic just about every single year. Total card volumes ex China today at $20 trillion. Uh, and there's another $14 trillion worth of cash and check left to digitize. Even at 80% level, card penetration is growing. So yes, we are moving towards a cashless society. A new technology is promised to kick these trends into a higher gear. The terminal on the till of the merchant. Now, depending on how old one is, one is used to that, um, at least in, in uh, the developed world. But it, that is not everywhere. But everyone has a phone. So electronic payments can end up in a super simple way in everybody's hands. And for our business, that's a massive growth opportunity. MasterCard is already seizing that opportunity. After dipping in 2020, revenues shot past pre-pandemic levels in 2021, driven by a rebound in consumer spending. CFO Sachin Mehra knows that this boom is likely to fade, and he's set on finding ways to keep the momentum going. The key to being successful in this kind of a, a environment is to have a diversified portfolio. You've got to be nimble from an expense standpoint. You've got to be very disciplined. As a finance officer, what I've got to do is I've got to make sure that we are investing in those resources which are currently in demand from a customer standpoint, but at the same time not losing sight of the long term. CEO Michael Meebach counts on Mayra to do more than just oversee the balance sheet. The top line for me is um, advisor and confident. He's, you're conciliary. Yes, he's quite happy pushing back and saying uh, vice versa. The role of the chief financial officer has actually changed fairly dramatically over this 20 plus year tenure that I've had. You know, in the past it was more of a function of, you know, let's make sure the numbers are good, let's make sure we get a great control environment, let's make sure we're actually able to close the books on time, let's make sure we've got all the financial elements of the business in order. The job of the CFO in, in our view, in my view, is a function of making sure we're creating the right linkage between what the purpose of the business is, what the strategy of the business is, and delivering on the financial returns for the company, all while driving long-term shareholder value. We're in the business of leading beyond the numbers. It's great that we know what the numbers are. How do we use those numbers to better drive execution of the business to accomplishment of the strategy of the company? MasterCard's core business is, no surprise, cards. Carded products currently account for over half the company's revenue. The company set ambitious growth targets at its 2021 Investor Day, committing to expand this core and to diversify beyond it. We've been on a six-year strategy to be a multi-rail company. Uh, in plain English, that means whichever way you pay, we will enable that. Despite the fact that card is in our name, it's essentially any type of payment. We have the reach, so I think we're reasonably well positioned. I mean, you've just got to recognize not only where the consumer is today, but where they're going to go, because a lot of what we've got to do takes time to implement. And is it difficult? You'll get, some, you'll get it right sometimes, you'll get it wrong sometimes, but hopefully you're getting it right more often than you're getting it wrong, yeah. and you're working your way through that. Forecasting preferences is complicated by an uncertain economy. Consumer confidence has been plunging to historic lows, and recession calls are getting louder. Still, a slowdown isn't likely to cause a crisis for MasterCard and its peers. Contrary to what people often perceive, I think payments as an industry it will be quite resilient in a downturn. Generally speaking, even during a recession, the amount that consumers spend actually does not go down. It continues to grow. I think the thing that people are worried about more um, in the payments industry is kind of how does the mix of spending change? The first thing that typically happens if you're going into a recessionary environment is people tend to pull back on discretionary categories of spend. They move into uh, the non-discretionary categories of spend. 
they pivot into food, they pivot into um, rent, those kind of payments which are most important for them to meet. But the rails still stay the same. So the rails which run debit and credit are exactly the same. The technology is the same, the distribution model is the same. So those, those areas don't necessarily change by virtue of moving into more of a debit or credit environment. One area that MasterCard has been moving vigorously into is B2B payments, a market expected to reach $25 trillion by the end of the decade. We think there's tremendous promise in the B2B area. The card business, as in the, the, the elements of the B2B space which are served by cards, um, are doing well, are they doing very well. And it's in the small business space, and the mid-market, it's in the large corporate space, all of them do really well. On the accounts payable side, I would say we're in the build uh, phase. And here we're about building an open loop environment to enable payments on accounts payable rails. Whereas the opportunity in that space is different to consumer payments, where there is a global standard. The global standard is MasterCard. The global standard are card payments because that's been established. That isn't quite established yet in B2B. And I think the more benefits we bring into the payments that are easier than just making a really complicated cross-border payment, I think we will find our way there. And uh, we're going to see an explosion of creativity and a lot of other companies coming in and using those rails, innovating on top of them. Pursuing new opportunities takes capital. MasterCard has spent billions acquiring companies that add capacity and diversify its infrastructure. Acquisitions and partnerships have helped MasterCard offer more value-added services to their clients, tapping into a lucrative revenue stream. What we call services, which includes data, insights, uh, consulting, managed services, loyalty, and our fraud capabilities, uh, is roughly 35% of the revenues of this company. Wow. Yeah. So it's not insignificant. So oftentimes people think MasterCard and think card. Very important, but there's a very different part of MasterCard as well. From a balance sheet perspective, MasterCard has maintained a healthy leverage ratio even as it's put more resources into acquisitions and taken on more debt, given the company flexibility to continue investing. We don't go in and say, well, right now valuations are lower than they were a year ago. Let's go and buy something. Um, that, is, that is an opportunistic approach. It doesn't work for us. For me, it always starts, what are we trying to accomplish from a strategy standpoint? What are our inherent capabilities we as a company have? What are the gaps in our inherent capabilities to meet that strategy? And then for those gaps, is it best to build, buy, or partner? And then we're out there and we're trying to find the right companies together and it's going to make sure that we have a clear view on short and long-term synergies and so forth. And then we both talk to shareholders and to investors to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it and why it's good. Shareholders have reason to appreciate MasterCard's capital allocation strategy. It's included annual share buybacks and steadily increased dividends. How do you prioritize the amount of money that you put toward innovation and toward building out different businesses versus share buybacks and dividends because MasterCard has traditionally had a robust program in rewarding shareholders? Right. First call of capital is towards growth of the business. After we have done that, it's about making sure we're being good stewards of capital and returning excess cash to shareholders with a bias towards share buybacks. And then once you start to come to say, I have dealt with my strategic priorities, I either have invested in my organic growth or in acquisitions, then excess cash, we will return back, generally with a preference for uh, buybacks over dividend because it gives us more flexibility. But that has been a good model for us. It's been working well and it's been uh, well received by the market. Coming up, how the tap has taken MasterCard places that the swipe alone could not. What it's really made a difference on has been in terms of how it's driving a shift from cash to electronic forms of payment, particularly on the small ticket items. And later, how MasterCard has staked out a place in the volatile universe of cryptocurrencies. In the crypto world, we play the role um, as an on-ramp. This is Bloomberg. Sachin Mehra joined MasterCard as group executive and corporate treasurer in 2010. Over the next decade, he took on several different roles before being appointed chief financial officer in 2019. That's a very different path than the one he started out on. I grew up in India. I went to school there, I went undergrad there, I worked with a family business there. It's a textile business which my grandfather started, my dad and my uncle took over, and then my brother and I got into. And, um, 
I worked with him for three and a half years. Uh, and then I came here for business school. The, the moment of truth came on graduation day. My dad got on the phone, he congratulated me. He said, well done, you graduated. I'm looking forward to having you back home. My brother, who's older than I am, who went to business school as well and went back home and worked with my dad, got on the phone, congratulated me and said, so Sachin, what are you gonna do with your life? And I'm going, well, why are we having this discussion? Dad wants me to come home and work with the family business. He's like, yep, that's what dad wants you to do. What do you want to do? And then it really got me thinking. And I said, hey, given a chance, I'd love to work in finance in, in the US. Mira took the chance, even though it took him six months to land his first job at General Motors, where he worked for over a decade. Then it was on to the energy industry at Hess Corporation before finding his way to MasterCard. Today, my dad couldn't be prouder of the fact that you know, I chose the path I did. Uh, obviously, he misses the fact that we're not there as a family, but that's just part of life, right? We've all got to grow and blossom and groom. <laughs> did he accept it at the beginning? It took him all of 30 minutes to get there. When Mera gets together with his team in the employee cafe on MasterCard's campus, it's clear that he's in his element. Well, more important, more fun stuff. What's the plan for the weekend? And of course, the cafe provides a demonstration of the tap and go technology that's changed the game for payment companies. Can I just get a regular coffee with milk, please? You want regular coffee? With milk, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, that will be 571. You got it. All right, we're going to make this work. There we go. I think contactless is a very powerful catalyst for accelerating cash to card conversion. In the last two years, what we have seen in the U.S. is card penetration growth rate annually has doubled versus what was the average in the prior five years. The pandemic was one of the reasons people didn't want to touch cash. There's a lot of e-commerce purchases, but contactless definitely contributed to this growth as well. It's made a change. It's really made a difference. What it's really made a difference on has been in terms of how it's driving a shift from cash to electronic forms of payment, particularly on the small ticket items, which is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, our model is as much about converting the dollar value of the spend as it is about the number of transactions we can get over our network. And even though it happens to be a $2 transaction, a transaction is a transaction on which we make revenue, on which we can deliver services, and that's really important. MasterCard introduced PayPass, its first contactless payment system, in 2002, but the technology took some time to gain traction. I would say we first invested in this many, 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 many years ago. The adoption rate on this in the early part, uh, even in markets like the UK, Canada, Australia, was fairly slow in the early part. The inflection point of when it really started to hit its stride was when it was used in the transit vertical. So what we figured is, let's get all the transit systems around the globe enabled for contactless technology. That will create muscle memory for the consumer who will like the experience in transit and will use it elsewhere. How do you judge the revenue proposition for MasterCard with an innovation like that and the adoption and the pace of it? Look, I mean, for us, we're agnostic as to whether somebody's using the chip technology or the contactless technology or you know, using the MagStripe, which was the old way of doing business. We earn revenues which are quite similar across both of those. The revenue potential and upside for us comes from the fact that now more spend is being done on card-based forms of payment than was being done in the past. So we're converting that cash over to electronic forms of payment, which is where the incremental revenue comes from. If contactless payments is the current revolution sweeping the payments industry, what's the next one? I think pay with your smile. So biometrics, I think that's where it's going to go. And I think we've reached that point that people are sick of too many passwords. People are sick of typing in stuff. And there's also too many wallets and other IDs and stuff that is around. So why don't you just, use, everybody has a smile. So just play with your smile, there you go. How much are you investing in that? How quickly do you see that becoming the next tap and go? Yeah, so look, I, I think this is gonna take a while. These things have an adoption curve, which typically is fairly flat in the early part, and then you start to see some level of steepness. MasterCard's next breakthrough may be born in one of its global tech hubs. The company has opened innovation centers in Australia, India, Europe, Canada, and the United States. These are uh, spaces where we draw in customers, where we draw the local community. We have them in big cities where the latest technologies and the players are all around us. In New York City, it's in Tech Alley, and everybody in the tech industry is around us. It's a point where people want to work 
and we attract the best talent. And we go, and this brings us back to the CFO, we go and look at our vita vitality index. So how are the, our revenues looking? What is generated from new products? What do we see? Is there real momentum? Is there real growth? And if you overlay that um, and link that back to our tech hubs in these regions where we have them, clearly that is what, driving, uh, what is driving our new solutions. From an investment standpoint, we try and make sure we've got our foot in the door in all of these new and emerging technologies, because what we don't want to do is play favorites with one versus the other. We want to make sure we're investing just appropriate amounts of money to have skin in the game, to know that if this thing has got legs to it, we want to be at the inflection point for them to ride out. In your tech hubs, can you act like Bond, James Bond, <laughs> in one of the Q movies and like the laboratories we walk in and they, you know, you sort of face off and clear the system and they the, sort of do this? There are some people who are privileged in this company who can do that, not everybody can. And I'm not one, I'm not one of them, I can tell <laughs> so you that's that. that's not you? No, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, how MasterCard has embraced the brave new world of cryptocurrency with all its ups and downs. So long as we follow our principles, we think we're in really good shape. And Sachin Mehra tells me what advice he'd offer a CFO just starting out in the job. I think it's important to stay calm. I think it, it's important to recognize that change is going to happen. You can't fight change. This is Bloomberg. Like many of its counterparts in the payments and financial services industry, MasterCard has developed products and partnerships that bring cryptocurrencies into its networks. I think from the payments and payment system perspective, the, the, the players and, and, and members that make up that ecosystem are really agnostic. To them, crypto is just another currency, literally, just another asset. At this point, the overall revenue contribution is still so small. Um, so it's very early, but if, if I'm a hard company, it's better to invest and also lean in and partner with some of these companies um, for future revenue growth rate versus kind of sitting on the sidelines. Crypto is a term that encompasses a number of different projects, including central bank digital currencies and private sector stable coins. Also, digital assets like Bitcoin, whose volatile valuations and susceptibility to fraud have raised plenty of anxiety among investors. MasterCard's long-term plans to stay in the space haven't wavered. We're not really in the crypto hype of investing, uh, investing around crypto. We like the fundamental technology and the promise that it brings to solve problems that have not been solved. So if we see more revenue coming out of B2B solutions that leverage blockchain technology, for example, tokenized uh, uh, bank deposits, you know, just to throw out one example, cross-border payments, whatever it might be. In the crypto world, we play the role um, as an on-ramp. So people use MasterCard card products to buy crypto our debit and credit products, so that's the on-ramp if people want to spend money as in fiat currency to buy crypto, and we act as the off-ramp. And the off-ramp is when people want to encash it, we help them actually gain access to be able to use their crypto balances everywhere MasterCard's accepted. We engage with central banks on central bank digital currencies, we engage with governments on how a policy could look like, how regulation could like, look like. We engage with the startup community and say, come on in, let's sit around the table in one of our tech hubs and we discuss what, what solution actually is needed by whom and how we can bring it together. They have the greatest idea, but the greatest idea needs a path to scale. That's what we can bring. Is there a potential liability because of the volatility, because of how Bitcoin and certain other cryptocurrencies have been painted. Is there any liability for MasterCard? Yeah, well, so long as we follow our principles, we think we're in really good shape. And the principles we care deeply about are uh, stability, as in stability of the currency in question. Point number two, it must meet consumer protection requirements. And it must meet the laws of the land. And this is not new news to us. We've done this in this space for the last 50 years for everything we've been working with regulated financial institutions on. Uh, and so, which is why when we got into the space, the first thing we did was define principles. And we will keep abiding by those principles in what we do. Yeah, I feel happy because we're in the discussion. We're shaping the ecosystem. And then one day it'll look like what we have done in many other spaces over years uh, 
over the past years. Sachin Mehra is a leader within a company that has the power and reach to shape ecosystems, and he'll be making strategic and financial decisions that shape the business. I wanted to know what he sees when he looks ahead. What's the opportunity for MasterCard in the next 10 years that most excites you? There still remains a very sizable consumer payments opportunity, which we stand very well poised to actually capitalize on. This is the trend of the shift from cash to electronic forms of payment. If you think about it globally, there's still a ton of cash which remains to be electronified, and that, that opportunity is huge. The second pillar for me is around, we have identified over the past few years a sizable total addressable market in what we call new payment flows. Bucket number three is around services. It goes back to our insights, analytics, our fraud management capabilities, and everything we're doing in that space. And then the last piece around new networks, which is around open banking and digital identity. What are some of the challenges for MasterCard over the next 10 years that keep you up at night? It's around staying plugged in on what's going on from a technology innovation standpoint and making sure we're leading from the front, not turning our back to it and saying, we're going to walk in the other direction. We've got to engage with people who could potentially be disintermediators, competitors, to let them know what value we can bring while they're executing on their strategy. So that's number one. Number two is, look, I mean, the world is getting more and more into a regulatory environment where regulation, regulators are playing a bigger role, nationalism is playing a bigger role. It's important for us to continue to do everything we're doing by being deemed local. It's important to be a global company, but be deemed local. And that's going to be important for us to execute on. Because at the end of the day, sitting in my role as the CFO, Strategy is great, vision's fantastic, but what really matters is can you really deliver and execute? And we've got to stay focused on execution, and that's what we do every day. What's the biggest change that you see your role having over the next 10 years? I, that's a really good question. I, I, honestly, I'm not really in the business of predicting that much as it relates to how it's going to change. What I can see happening is greater emphasis on making sure we're leading from the front on executing but also failing fast and that's where a CFO can play a big role and by that I mean there, you're not always going to win there are things you're going to do hopefully you get more right than wrong but recognizing things which are not working out and making sure you actually fail fast on them and get out of them because you can get you can fall in love with stuff keep doing it keep wasting resources to only realize that it's not going to pay off and I think the emphasis around that is going to only increase for, that, for CFOs in a scarce capital resource environment. What advice would you give a CFO today? I, I think it's important to stay calm. I think it, it's important to recognize that change is going to happen. You can't fight change. What really matters is how you can get up and actually deal with that change. That's super important for a CFO. Being really clear and crisp in your communications. The outside world wants to hear in very simple terms what exactly this company stands for and why they should believe that you are a good investment. And notice I've said nothing about financials and I've said nothing about necessarily financial infrastructure and systems because I do believe as a CFO, those things are table stakes. You've got to make sure that stuff happens. You've got to leverage technology. You've got to drive efficiency in the business. You've got to get the numbers right. You've got to have a good control environment. But what's going to call you apart is the, is the other elements which I spoke about. If MasterCard can meet ambitious goals for growth in its core business and build on strategies that are taking payments to the next level, Sachin Mehra will deserve a lot of the credit. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. This is Bloomberg.